So, good afternoon. I hate to interrupt your socializing. I promise you we will make up for it uh, at, at, at the end of this. Uh, good afternoon and a warm welcome to our national and international guests, colleagues, and students. My name is Nancy Adler, Professor of Memory, History, and Transitional Justice at the New York Institute for War, Holocaust, and Genocide Studies and University of Amsterdam, and member of the Steering Committee of the Historical Dialogues, Justice, and Memory Network. The last time we gathered was in December 2019 at Columbia University for the eighth annual conference, focusing on prevention activism and advancing historical dialogue in post-conflict settings. Considering that 2020 marked the 75th anniversary of the Nuremberg proceedings, and we intended to host the ninth conference in the Netherlands, we opted to move from the prevention activism discussion to a broader examination of whether, or rather, the extent to which the search for social, political, historical, and legal accountability is still a work in progress. The steering committee unanimously agreed on inviting Professor Ben Kiernan of Yale University to be our keynote speaker. At the end of February 2020, I contacted Professor Kiernan to extend our invitation and inquire about his availability for December of that year. We were delighted with his positive response and the dates looked like they would work. We corresponded back and forth and then came that ominous moment in early March of 2020. Ben wrote that the final decision would, of course, depend on the health situation in Europe at that time. I agreed, but added, quote, luckily this conference is months and seasons from now. I was teaching at Columbia that semester. Quite literally the next day, my classes were canceled, presumably to pick up the thread two weeks later after spring break. In those two weeks, but actually I think it was two days, the campus shut down completely. Grimness descended on Morningside Heights and the world. The Columbia dorms, forcibly abandoned by the students, now house doctors from nearby hospitals battling the emergency of a fierce and fairly unknown enemy. You all know the rest, so I will suffice it to say for now that we are so grateful to have you gathered here today in person. This conference was postponed twice. We opted out of an online venue because we thought we all needed a chance to have the type of robust discussion and hallway gray time that had once been second nature. Now I actually find myself, as I'm sure do many of you, so accustomed to virtual gatherings that I insti instinctively reach for the unmute button before speaking. It has now been 77 years since the convening of the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg and the International Military Tribunal for the Far East in Tokyo. The beginnings of institutionalized accountability measures for reckoning with crimes against humanity, war crimes, genocide, and massive violations of human rights. Despite the never again avowals in the wake of the Holocaust, in this three quarters of a century, we have witnessed new and recurrent cycles of mass state-sponsored violence that cast a wide geographic net. Unfortunately, we don't even have to look that far to see war crimes, crimes of aggression, and other atrocities. Russia's unbridled attack on Ukraine has brought this to our doorstep. We have some 60,000 refugees from Ukraine in the Netherlands right now. Most of them are women and children. Many sincerely wish they could return and are requesting to do so despite the risks. Several accepted submissions to this conference pulled out because the contributors took up arms. With regard to our conference's query on the search for accountability, the only heartening, if one could even use such a word in this context, aspect of this conflict is that considerable evidence is being collected and documented. This is already the beginning of the quest for accountability. And we'll talk more about Ukraine in a panel tomorrow. The paper and panel submissions for this conference bear witness to the fact that the global ascent of the human rights discourse and the search for accountability has now broadened considerably 
to encompass reparations for slavery, the restitution of looted art, intellectual property, and human remains, the renaming of institutions, buildings, and streets, the removal of memorials, and related measures. During this conference, in 30 panels, some 110 contributors will attest to the recurrence of violence and the personal, legal, societal, and political responses to it. Against this backdrop, it is my privilege to welcome and introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Ben Kiernan, genocide specialist, and the A. Whitney Griswold Professor Emeritus of History at Yale University. He was founding director of the Cambodian Genocide Program and of the Genocide Studies Program from 1998 to 2015. Additionally, he was chair of Yale's Council on Southeast Asian Studies. Professor Kiernan's books span a wide range of subjects and include How Pol Pot Came to Power, The Pol Pot Regime, Genocide and Resistance in Southeast Asia, Blood and Soil, A World History of Genocide and Extermination from Sparta to Darfur, and Vietnam, A History from Earliest Times to the Present. Today, he will look at the causes, ideological underpinnings, and consequences of mass political terror in his address entitled Nazis, Stalinists, and Khmer Rouge, Accountability for Genocide. After Professor Kiernan's lecture, there will be an opportunity for questions from the audience, after which we will look forward to welcoming you for a reception in the, in the Senats Kammer in the back of the aula. Last but definitely not least, a word of acknowledgement. This conference and today's reception have been made possible by the support of the New York Institute for War, Holocaust, and Genocide Studies and Academy of Sciences, who gave seed money for our research on transitional justice and by the generous contribution of my research school, the Amsterdam School for Heritage, Memory, and Material Culture of the University of Amsterdam. Professor Kiernan, we are so grateful to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you all for coming. It's a great pleasure to be here in Amsterdam. I've often called it my favorite city. I'd like to thank the Netherlands Institute for War, Holocaust, and Genocide Studies for the invitation. In his 2015 book, The Rise of Islamic State, ISIS and the New Sunni Revolution, the Middle East expert, Patrick Coburn, wrote of the religious intolerance and political authoritarianism of Wahhabism, the fundamentalist 18th century version of Islam that lies behind the contemporary Islamic State movement. He wrote that, quote, in its readiness to use violence, it has many similarities with European fascism in the 1930s. But Coburn also wrote of Islamic State, the world had seen nothing like their use of public violence to terrorize their opponents since the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia 40 years earlier. Drawing similarities between the violence of genocidal Middle East jihadis, pre-war European fascists, and Khmer Rouge communists of the 1970s can yield comparative insights on conditions and motivations that give rise to genocide. It is possible for such disparate movements to share characteristics, if not connections, for a range of reasons. They may first simply emerge from similar socio-political backgrounds, or instead, secondly, they may deliberately borrow ideas or practices from one another, or else, thirdly, they may independently and quite unknowingly adopt similar strategies and tactics. Any of these possibilities could prove revealing for those hoping to understand, deter, or defeat such political movements. Pol Pot's regime of democratic Kampuchea, or DK, shared some important characteristics with Nazism, but it also demonstrated some important connections to Stalinism. Although democratic Kampuchea 
emerged from Cambodia's quite different socio-political environment, it leaders, its leaders did independently adopt some similar practices to those of the Nazis, as well as quite selectively borrowing ideas and practices from Stalinism and Maoism. The DK parallels with Nazi crimes are clear. First, virulent racism. Second, the perpetration of multiple cases of genocide and crimes against humanity. And third, ambitions of territorial expansionism and brutal aggression conducted by DK against all three of Cambodia's neighboring countries, Vietnam, Thailand, and even Laos as well. In terms of accountability in the Cambodian case, Pol Pot, the Secretary General of the Communist Party of Kampuchea, the CPK, died in his sleep in 1998. But 20 years later, in 2018, the UN-sponsored tribunal, the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia, or ECCC, found Pol Pot's former Deputy Secretary General, Nguyen Chia, and the head of state of the former DK regime, Kyu Samporn, guilty of the genocide of the ethnic Vietnamese minority in Cambodia, as well as guilty of perpetrating crimes against humanity against them. The tribunal in Phnom Penh convicted these two men, the most senior surviving leaders of the Pol Pot DK regime, of at least three counts of crimes against humanity, not only of murder and extermination of ethnic Vietnamese, but also of their persecution on racial grounds, quote unquote. The judges found in the cases of both Nguyen Chia and Q Samporn, quote, that the intended discriminatory acts were deliberate killing of Vietnamese on a large scale, unquote. Now Nguyen Chia was also found guilty of a second genocide, that of the ethnic charm Muslim minority in Cambodia. The ECCC had previously, in 2014, convicted both men, Nguyen Chia and Kyu Samporn, of crimes against humanity for the persecution and mass murder of members of their country's Khmer majority population, and they were already serving life sentences in Phnom Penh when they were convicted of genocide. In addition, Duc, the former commandant of their regime's central secret prison, S21, served a life sentence after being convicted in 2010 of crimes against humanity. These three convictions, delayed for nearly four decades after the crimes were committed, finally offered some significant measure of justice for the victims. Also, in recent years, three other senior Khmer Rouge leaders have been arrested and jailed. Two of them, Yang Sari and Yang Tirit, both senior ministers in Pol Pot's former government, also faced trial or the prospect of a trial, although they didn't live to face judgment. Yang Sari, Deputy Prime Minister of the DK regime, died in prison in 2013 during his trial for crimes against humanity. He too had been additionally charged with genocide, for which he was scheduled to face a second trial. His wife, Yang Tirit, was also jailed, but her trial, her trial didn't proceed only because the court found her to be mentally debilitated and unfit to be tried. She died in 2015. The Khmer Rouge's top military commander, Mok, was arrested in 1999 and died in a Cambodian jail in 2006, awaiting prosecution. Only Pol Pot himself and one other senior leader, Kai Pok, escaped arrest among the top leaders of the regime. Both died before the ECCC tribunal was formed. The several additional trials that Cambodia's Prime Minister Hun Sen is now preventing the United Nations from prosecuting in Cambodia should, of course, still go ahead. 
they are of relatively second rank officials who seem to have committed major crimes. Hugh St. Paul, by contrast, was the first head of state to be found guilty of genocide in an international court. So I think it's true that some significant measure of accountability has finally been achieved in the Cambodian case. In his 1986 book, Brother Enemy, the veteran Indochina correspondent, Nayan Chanda, described what he called a Cambodian version of a final solution to the Vietnamese threat, a campaign to physically exterminate all ethnic Vietnamese still remaining in Cambodia. Chanda was reporting on his 1981 Phnom Penh interview with survivor Ross Saruan, a Cambodian mechanic who had married an ethnic Vietnamese woman. In April 1977, repairing a jeep in the office of his district chief, Saruan had inadvertently read on the desk a letter marked, quote, directive from 870, which is the Machem or the center of the Communist Party of Kampuchea, CPK. Dated April 1st, 1977, the letter ordered that, quote, all ethnic Vietnamese in the district and all Khmers who spoke Vietnamese or had Vietnamese friends should be handed over to the state security service, the Sante Ba. When Saruan got home that day, his wife told him that a Vietnamese woman in the village had been bludgeoned to death by the Khmer Rouge. And several days later, Saruan's wife herself disappeared. He eventually found her partially buried corpse. More recently, in 2021, the Cambodian political scientist Kasal Pat has written in terms similar to those of Nayan Chanda. The Lon Nol regime's 1970 violence, he wrote, against the ethnic Vietnamese community was a precursor to the Khmer Rouge's adoption of its version of a final solution to the Vietnamese problem, a brutal policy recognized as genocide by the UN-sponsored tribunal in 2018. Now we know that the Nazis murdered a proportion of Jews and Roma and Poles that was far higher than the proportional death toll among Germans in the Nazi era. Cambodia's minorities under the DK regime experienced a similar tragic fate. About 15% of the rural Khmer perished in the DK period and 25% of the urban Khmer who were more seriously, severely persecuted. Suggesting an overall death, Khmer death rate among the Khmer majority of about 19%. The death rates among the minorities were much higher. Among the Vietnamese, over 99% of those who remained in the country after 1976 were killed. Ethnic Chinese, 50% perished. Cham Muslims, between 36 and 41%. Lao, 40%. Thai, 40%. Of course, the absolute number of 1.3 million dead among the majority Khmer population is enormous and largely attributable to crimes against humanity. But many of these deaths occurred during the DK regime's largest episode of mass killing. That was the mass killing of the Eastern Zone population of Cambodia from May to December 1978. On May 10th, 1978, the regime broadcast on the radio a call to purify the masses of the people. DK forces murdered at least 100,000 and possibly as many as 250,000 Khmers from the Eastern Zone in that short period of months alone. The victims were accused of having Khmer bodies with Vietnamese heads. The CPK turned its vicious racist ideology against its own Khmer people in a genocidal manner. To some extent, 
this had also happened in Nazi Germany. Hitler's best field marshal, as he's been described, Walter Model, believed as Hitler did in German racial supremacy in Europe. But as with Hitler, that by no means extended to a loyalty to the German people as a whole. Model ordered ruthless punishment of what he called inferior elements in the civilian population. And as defeat loomed, Hitler himself remarked, if the war is lost, then the people too is lost. The people had shown itself to be the weaker. What will remain after this struggle will be in any case only the inferior ones, Hitler went, said, since the good ones have fallen. During World War II, German military casualties alone rivaled even the massive continental Jewish death toll of nearly six million. As for the wartime civilian toll, the disabled, communists, homosexuals, Jehovah's Witnesses and others, the Nazis killed as many as 340,000 Germans, as well as 160,000 German Jews in their euthanasia programs and their racial, political and religious persecutions. Now the political worldview of the Pol Pot group encompassed an obsession with Cambodian national and racial revivalism. The CPK leaders thought they would recover Cambodia's original pre-Buddhist glory, surpass the powerful economy of the medieval Angkor Kingdom, and regain its lost territory from Vietnam and Thailand. This is a map of the extent of the territory of the Angkor period in medieval times. But the inspiration behind this vision was not totally indigenous. The experience of French colonialism had exaggerated this Cambodian sense of glory lost. For instance, a sculpture group erected in the 1920s at the stairway below Marseille railway station depicts a recumbent Cambodian Apsara, celestial dancer, which you can see here, being attended by a prostrate Vietnamese boy and a Lao girl. The statuary elevates Cambodia to a privileged position, superior to that of Vietnam and Laos. French colonial ideology aimed to preserve Khmer culture and to emphasize Cambodia's historic role in Southeast Asia by excavating and studying the ancient monuments of Angkor. And this colonial ideology was, however, also partly designed to keep restless Vietnamese nationalists in their place under French rule. And it was perfectly suited to encourage the young Salat so, who later took the name Pol Pot, to dream of recasting himself as the original Khmer, Khmer Dam. He arrived in Marseille in September 1949 by ship from Saigon. It is easy to imagine him climbing the stairway to catch his first train to Paris carefully studying this sculpture group depicting Cambodia's superiority to Vietnam. Born in 1925, Pol Pot had reached adulthood in French Indochina under the wartime pro-Nazi Vichy administration. He and Kusampon attended a Cambodian high school where every morning the pupils had to salute Marshal Pétain with the words, Maréchal, nous voilà. Pétainist agrarian ideology, focusing on the French countryside, also percolated into Cambodia. It is apparent in Kusampon's Paris doctoral dissertation on Cambodia's economy, which emphasized relying on the country's domestic agricultural resources and separating Cambodia from other countries' economies. The DK state that they later founded treasured the Cambodian race, not individuals. As Pol Pot put it in 1978, we do not worry that one day our army may run out of men, for the local population from which we can recruit is unlimited. 
Khmer peasant casualties were not a problem to Pol Pot. National impurities were. These impurities included the foreign educated, except for Pol Pot's Paris educated group, and those the party center called hereditary enemies, especially Vietnamese. To return Cambodians to their imagined origins, the Pol Pot group saw the need for war and for, quote, secrecy as the basis, unquote, of their revolution. Few of the grassroots, more pragmatic, veteran Cambodian communists could be trusted to implement such plans, which Pol Pot kept secret from them. Hatred of the Vietnamese had roots in the personal as well as in the political. Nguyen Chia has given us an insider account of what Pol Pot had personally told him about his racist beliefs since his youth. Pol Pot said to Nguyen Chia, I hated Vietnamese youth from the time I was young because the Vietnamese were rude and too clever at playing unfair tricks while playing football against me and other Cambodian children. That that childish personal prejudice grew political. On April 22nd, 1976, Pol Pot described Vietnam as, quote, a black dragon that spits its poison. That same month, the CPK official journal, Tung Pa Di Wat, or Revolutionary Flags, described DK's expulsion of foreign nationals, its term for the domestic ethnic Vietnamese minority and the charms and the ethnic Chinese minority, even though most of them were Cambodian born and had lived in the country for decades, if not generations. Later, the DK regime issued racist public statements such as this. The whole Kampuchea's people are against Vietnam, which is a hereditary enemy, unquote. In April 1978, Pol Pot boasted that not a single Vietnamese remained living in Cambodia. The very next month, on May 10th, DK Radio launched an appeal to purify the DK armed forces, our party, and the masses of the people. The radio then added, each one of us must kill 30 Vietnamese. So far, we have succeeded. Using these figures, one Cambodian soldier is equal to 30 Vietnamese soldiers. We should have 2 million troops for 60 million Vietnamese. However, 2 million troops would be more than enough to fight the Vietnamese because Vietnam has only 50 million inhabitants. This DK radio broadcast then went on to reveal the Pol Pot regime's willingness not only to annihilate all 50 million of Vietnamese, Vietnam's inhabitants, but also to sacrifice 2 million of the 8 million Cambodians in the attempt. The radio broadcast continued, we do not need 8 million people. We need only 2 million troops to crush the 50 million Vietnamese and we would still have 6 million people left. Pol Pot had already proclaimed that large numbers of Cambodian deaths pose no problem. The people of the lower classes are very numerous, he said. In the ECCC's trial chamber's judgment on the genocide cases, the judges wrote, the one against 30 policy expressly encompassed the total populations of both countries, with Pol Pot referring throughout his statement to 50 million, the total population of Vietnam, against 8 million, the total population of Cambodia, thus including both combatants and civilians. Therefore, the chamber finds that this call was directed against the ethnic Vietnamese population as a whole, not just the military forces of Vietnam. It is clear, I conclude, that homegrown racism was an important feature of Khmer Rouge ideology. The Pol Pot's DK regime did demonstrate important connections to Stalinism, including brutal class warfare, internecine political purges, and the enforcement of mass starvation. On the other hand, 
Unlike Stalin's regime with its urban industrial bias, starving the countryside, including much of Ukraine, in order to extract food for industry and the city. Nevertheless, the Pol Pot regime pursued a rural bias, similar to that of Mao's China. Yet, it even claimed to outdo Mao's China with what it called in Cambodian, Maha Lutpla, Maha Asha, which means a super great leap forward, not just a great leap forward. DK's borrowings from both Stalinism and Maoism were clear, but quite selective. In Cambodia in 1980, I photographed many of the prison records left behind by the Pol Pot regime, which had been ousted the previous year. On returning to Australia, I read Robert Conquest's book, The Great Terror, on the Soviet purges of the 1930s. This passage caught my attention. For the 1936 trial, Conquest wrote, Molchanov had prepared for Stalin a special diagram, a system of many colored lines on the diagram indicated when and through whom Trotsky had communicated with the leaders of the conspiracy. My mind immediately went back to the charts I had photographed, shown here, of alleged rebel or foreign agent contact networks drawn up by DK security cadre at their headquarters, S21 prison in Phnom Penh. Their many colored lines connecting rows of boxes containing data on each person they implicated seemed almost a direct imitation of the Soviet technique of the 1930s. Further, Robert Conquest's statement that the dossiers of the leading figures targeted by Stalin have the low numbers. Piatikov, Roman numeral one. Radek, Roman numeral five. Sokolnikov, Roman numeral eight. Drobnis, Roman numeral 13. That took me back to my notes of the S21 dossiers I'd seen in Phnom Penh, where I'd written Roman numerals used by prison interrogators for top prisoners. The names of numbers 1 to 19 in Roman numerals I had copied down. Now the use in each case of Roman numerals and even of similar diagrams may well be coincidence, but it was tempting to suspect otherwise given the confessional nature of the Cambodian prison records. They resembled what we knew of the archives of Stalinism in nearly every way with the important exception that the Cambodian records were kept secret. Not even show trials were held in DK. And the very existence of S21 prison became known to the outside world only after that regime was overthrown. That aside, could S21 security personnel have been formally trained in the bureaucratic and other interrogation techniques of the Stalinist purges? perhaps in Mao's China of the early 1970s, perhaps by Kang Sheng, a leader of the Chinese Communist Party's Politburo, who was in Moscow during the 1930s. Other possible parallels are connect and connections are worth pursuing, particularly in the realm of ideology. To what extent was Pol Pot's regime Marxist? And to what extent did it consider itself so? In early 1977, the CPK's third ranking leader, Yang Sari, whom I've already mentioned, facing trial but dying during the trial, he told foreigners in Singapore in 1977, we are not communists, we are revolutionaries. Now this was disinformation. The Communist Party of Kampuchea was officially unveiled just later that same year. But Yang Sari's statement was also a signal of a conscious departure from Marxist orthodoxy. As the CPK's internal magazine, Tung Pati Wat, put it in late 1976, left or not left, we must stand by the movement. We must not stand by the scriptures. What did that mean in terms of orthodox Marxism? Now, the CPK leaders certainly believed in the existence of classes, including, including feudalists, 
capitalists, workers and peasants. They murdered many hundreds of people as feudalists and capitalists. But they did not rigorously follow orthodox Marxist class analysis or strategy. Here is how Tung Pari Wat put it in September 1976. Quote, there is a worker class which has some kind of stand. We have not focused on it yet, unquote. And by 1977, the next year, the CPK was proclaiming in a party history, we did not rely on the forces of the workers. The workers were the overt vanguard, but in concrete fact, they did not become the vanguard. In concrete fact, there were only the peasants. Therefore, we did not copy anyone, unquote. Soon after their 1975 victory and evacuation of the cities, the CPK divided Cambodians into three new classifications, which they named full rights people, candidates, and the deported urban populations, depositees. The first two categories, full rights and candidates, are Leninist classifications for party members. But the CPK now applied these quite differently to the country's population as a whole. So the key issue is not the names of all these social divisions and classifications, but how they were applied and how they worked in practice. The methods by which the Pol Pot regime assigned people to such classes were not necessarily determined by their relationship to the means of production or to one another, or even to their geographical origin. If the CPK assigned people to a class based on their race, say, all Chinese are capitalists, or if it excluded people from a certain class because of their race, say, no charms are working class, and if such declarations contradicted the social facts, these would constitute clear cases of racism rather than class analysis. And indeed, that's exactly what the CPK did. All Chinese became uh, class enemies because all Chinese were considered capitalists. Many were workers, but it didn't matter because they were Chinese. The same with Charms. The party put out a statement saying all uh, ethnic groups have workers except for Charms, even though many of them were rubber plantation workers. Uh, and so Charms were by the virtue of their race, because they were charms, were excluded from the working class. So this is a decision made on the basis of race, racism rather than class analysis. The CPK uh, also con uh, consigned ethnic Vietnamese, uh, whether they were from the countryside or from the cities, uh, as uh, enemies, no matter what, their origin uh, because they were Vietnamese, based on race, no matter, no class considerations or geographical considerations, whether they came from the cities or the countryside. The CPK forcibly imposed punitive racist generalizations on all three of these domestic ethnic minority groups, Vietnamese, Cham and Chinese, whose populations, as I've shown, it devastated at rates even higher than were suffered by the majority Cambodian population. The September-October 1976 issue of the CPK journal Tung Pari Wat described dialectical materialism, the Marxist concept, as, quote, the most basic document of Marxism-Leninism. How then did the CPK approach this topic? which it claimed to be fundamental to its own thinking as well. What can this tell us about the CPK's ideology and practice? Now, in 1950, when Pol Pot was a student in Paris, Stalin republished his 1938 study called Dialectical and Historical Materialism. And Stalin divided the subject into three sections, the dialectical method, secondly, philosophical materialism, and thirdly, historical materialism. And the first section, as you can see there on the screen, uh, is made up of uh, the uh, four uh, 
observations of Stalin, uh, all phenomena are organically interrelated. Nature is in continuous movement, change and development. Development involves quantitative change becoming qualitative change and internal contradictions are inherent in all things. A quarter century later, in its September, October 1976 issue, Tung Pariwat presented what it called a review of dialectical materialism. It's revealed the influence on the CPK of Stalin's work, but never mentioned his name. It summarized, however, only the first section of Stalin's outline of the subject, that is, on the dialectical method. It never mentioned philosophical materialism or historical materialism. It left those two sections, the, the second and third section, out altogether. In other words, what for Stalin was only the method became for the CPK the philosophy itself. The CPK simply excluded Stalin's two materialist sections that followed his initial section on the dialectical method. And what resulted was a kind of dialectical voluntarism rather than materialism, perhaps closer to Hegel's metaphysics than to Marx. All omitted in the second and third sections, but omitted from the Khmer Rouge discussion were the material nature of the world, the primacy of matter, objective truth, modes of production, productive forces, and relations of production. What the CPK apparently considered important was the subjective method or the approach or tactics to be adopted. So let's turn to this and see what the CPK did with Stalin's discussion of objective, uh, of the di dialectical method. The first point of what Mar uh, Stalin called the Marxist dialectical method is that all phenomena are organically interrelated. Tung Padiwat notes this and then gives what it said was an example to illustrate the law of dialectical materialism. The example is revealing, quote, in the situation of a person who has injured a buffalo's leg, we must analyze. We must ask if the child or the old man who tends the animal injured it, or who else did, and if it was done, why? Was it unintentional, or was it to oppose the cooperative? Look for a person who has something to do with this matter. The cow herd, what background is he from? What class stand? What political stand? Which milieu is his stand in contact with? We follow up. Following up is a measure. If we cannot find out in one or two days, we will find out in two or three days. In this way, the first feature of the Marxist dialectical method, that all phenomena are organically interrelated, was perceived in CPK ideology in terms of the rationale for a witch hunt and the other elements of the dialectical method I won't go into, into but they follow in similar uh, tone that uh, they justify a political witch hunt. The dialectical method is everything is interconnected, we must look for our enemies everywhere, and so on. And again with the idea of uh, the, uh, not materialism, but voluntarism, Tung Pariwat instructed uh, its readers to pull out weeds, add water and fertilizer by pushing the socialist revolutionary consciousness and stance. In other words, a really an anti-materialist uh, word of advice that uh, it's voluntarism à l'outrance. The person who fails to add water, who breaks a plowshare or injures a buffalo's leg must be and was suspected of deliberate treason. All this, of course, adds weight to the CPK's total deletion of Stalin's discussion of materialism, totally deleted from the CPK discussion. But its significance would probably end there, but for the use to which such theoretical passages were put in DK. The broad, partly incomprehensible theories were applied in three ways. 
to individuals rather than to historical classes. Secondly, future treason was considered discernible in minor displays of attitude, or if undiscerned, future treason could even be considered as merely hidden. And three, such predicted developments, although in a sense metaphysically determined, were still considered preventable by human vigilance. And here the quote from uh, Tung Pa De Wat. For instance, a bud of material property. Do not nurse it. Eliminate it immediately. Therefore, we will be masters over ourselves. The CPK's discussion of internal contradictions was closer to Mao's theory of contradictions among the people than it was to Stalin's dialectics. CPK members were warned not to confuse the two types of contradictions, but the greater risk was said to be making a seri uh, make, mistaking a serious contradiction for a less serious one. So if you think that a serious contradiction is less serious, you're in danger of letting an accused person off the hook. If we have a life and death contradiction, we cannot think it is an internal contradiction, says Tung Padiwat. Now, interestingly, the converse, or the reverse, was what Mao had chosen to warn against. Mao wrote, in an instructive contrast to the CPK, quote, <clears throat> those with a left way of thinking magnify contradictions between ourselves and the enemy to such an extent that they take certain contradictions among the people for contradictions with the enemy and regard as counter-revolutionaries persons who are not really counter-revolutionary. Now Mao is not widely known as a moderate, but I think we could say that in the case of the CPK, uh, he took a more moderate stance than did the CPK. And the risk uh, that he pointed out was not the one spelled out by Tung Pa De Wat. By Mao's criteria, the CPK had committed an error and adopted a left way of thinking. The CPK leaders obviously did not consider it so dangerous for their party to treat an internal contradiction as a life and death one. It was, of course, very dangerous for the society, especially one run by a bureaucratic and rigidly hierarchical, par hierarchical party whose cadres would feel safe overfilling, overfulfilling their quotas of contradictions resolved rather than underfulfilling them. One slogan of the period used to describe policy towards the urban evacuees, as testified by many survivors, was consistent with the view that there was little danger in mistaking internal contradictions for life and death ones. And this is the Khmer Rouge slogan, spare them no profit, remove them no loss. And this chilling, chilling epigram was quite unique, even for the most ruthless communist regimes. In conclusion then, the officially proclaimed CPK view of dialectical materialism excluded any consideration of philosophical materialism or historical materialism. Again, on the same theme of excluding the importance of material factors, we read in Tung Pa De Wat, technology is not a determining factor. The determining factors of the revolution are politics, revolutionary people, and the revolutionary system. Now this statement obviously owes something to Maoist ideology in its preference for red over expert, expressed here in a simplistic form. It seems to me that it's nevertheless a very different statement from that of the Cambodian Marxist Hu Yun who wrote in 1964, just a decade before the Khmer Rouge took power, that social change and technological advancement should go together. And here is what Hu Yun wrote in 1964. Our country, just like any other in the world, must advance. Economic progress must be built on the foundation of modern technology. Given our country's qualities, 
How can we introduce modern technology to in increase production? Our country, like any other, cannot ignore modern technology, which must be applied in one way or another in agriculture. This is because modern technology is much more efficient than the old methods. We will now discuss the methods which, which technology can introduce to further our two goals, that is, increasing production by increasing the forces of production and solving the problems relating to human beings, social problems. In a number of so non-socialist countries, the exploitation of farmland has been assisted by modern methods. Agricultural production has increased tremendously because agricultural machinery and science have challenged the power of nature. But a number of peasants have descended into the ranks of agricultural laborers, living by selling their labor. The introduction of modern technology seems to place a heavy burden on the necks of the workers. And then Hu Yun went on to advise, Co cooperative methods can solve both these aspects of the rural problems in the interest of the peasants by full use of scientific and technological methods and also by increasing the standards of the living of the workers. Cooperatives support the workers so that they become the masters of their lives, their possessions and their work. Politics and technology must be combined for sound cooperative development. There should be a plan, he emphasised this in his own italics, to diffuse widely technical knowledge throughout the people's environment. Now, this Marxist vision of peasant cooperatives could not be more distant from the CPK's vision of Cambodia's peasantry, for whom, in the CPK's words, technology is not a determining factor. Hu Yun was a member of the Central Committee of the CPK from 1971, but he was already speaking out against CPK Centre policies. In 1970, he had reportedly, quote, dared to scold Pol Pot, claiming that the Centre was using his name as a screen by making him, quote, a puppet minister in the insurgent Khmer Rouge cabinet. In 1971 and 1972, who Yun opposed centre plans for land collectivisation, the elimination of markets, the evacuation of towns, and attacks on Vietnamese troops. In 1974 and early 1975, as the centre finalised its plans for the evacuation of Phnom Penh after its capture, Hu Yun opposed those plans, as well as plans to repress Buddhism and to abolish money. He then pursued his descent immediately after the capture of Phnom Penh and the CPK's forced evacuation of the capital. At a meeting in Phnom Penh on May 20th, 1975, Pol Pot ordered, among other things, the creation of high-level cooperatives throughout the country with communal eating, in other words, no more family meals. A witness reported that Hu Yun spoke up and said that this was just not possible. The country had just emerged from a war, so there were great shortages and a lack of capital and facilities. Communal eating cooperatives throughout the country was not a feasible proposition, Hu Yun said. And the witness reports, after that, Hu Yun was sacked from the cabinet. Indeed, his oppositional stance made Hu Yun one of the first targets of the CPK Centre. In his 1977, S21 prison confession, uh, his former comrade Hu Nim revealed, after liberation, when the party abolished money and wages and evacuated the people, Hu Yun again boldly took a stand against the party line. Among other things, he, quote, criticised the plan to turn pagodas into stables. He apparently survived, Hu Yun, he apparently survived until August 1975 four or five months after the evacuation of Phnom Penh, when according to a report from a CPK cadre, Hu Yun addressed a large gathering of evacuees and others on the Mekong River. He spoke out strongly against the evacuation and was applauded by the crowd. Soon after living, leaving this meeting, Hu Yun was shot dead by a CPK squad and his body was thrown into the Mekong. 
Three years later, a confidential CPK report, which I've seen, confirmed that, quote, in 1975, we killed the contemptible Hu Yun, unquote. Hu Yun was a Marxist, but it is difficult to categorize him as a Stalinist or a Ma Maoist. In 1964, he had argued that those he termed the little people must be able to hold their heads high and open their mouths freely and as masters of the cooperatives for their own benefits. And he also emphasised the need for democratic processes in the organisation of cooperatives. On the other hand, the CPK Centre too departed, significantly departed from both Stalinism and Maoism, while it shared some characteristics with Nazism, as we've seen. What perhaps is most striking about the CPK's ideology and practice is that it included a combination of elements shared by all three, Nazism, Stalinism, and Maoism. It is perhaps not surprising then that one of the very first victims of the CPK, along with many thousands of other Cambodians, was a Marxist whose record suggests that he had far less in common with any of these three 20th century totalitarian ideologies. Thank you. So thank you, Professor Kieran. I'm going to come to this side for this very rich talk. Uh, I know that there are questions, but I thought I would take uh, the privilege of uh, making a, a short comment and asking the first question while uh, the audience maybe thinks of what they would perhaps like to uh, ask. So uh, on the issue of uh, standing by the movement, um, the rationales for the witch hunt, you mentioned uh, Conquests, uh, The Great Terror, very influential book, certainly influenced uh, my development. These leading figures, Pyatakov and uh, Sakolnikov, whom you mentioned, Pyatakov was so devoted to the party that he said, if the party says black is white and white is black, I will believe that and, and, and that will drive me. And he was executed. Sokolnikov, uh, uh, also a, uh, an old Bolshevik crony of Lenin, uh, executed, and Sokolnikov's wife and daughter uh, were sent to the Gulag for about 17 years. Mm -hmm. They emerged as party propagandists. Mm -hmm. So there's a commonality of a, an entrenched ideology, uh, and I think part of it is because the population was terrorized. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to move to the accountability question, mm -hmm. which is very, very complex, mm -hmm. uh, but you, you mentioned that the, the first head of state to be found guilty of genocide in an international court. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you if you could connect, let's say, the public's response. Uh, we are talking about a population uh, that was entrenched in this ideology for a long time. I don't say that they subscribe to it, but what was the response to that? Uh, because accountability, uh, I guess, um, can be, uh, can take root mostly when the ideology has been uh, completely, when the population has been able to distance itself from the ideology. Uh, no, yeah. Thank you for those questions. Um, just briefly on the uh, confessional nature of uh, the Khmer Rouge prison system, because it was completely secret, uh, the outside world didn't know anything about it, and there were no show trials. It's very difficult to, to know uh, to what extent the prisoners' confessions were legitimate uh, and to what extent they were confessed under torture. I mean, we have uh, very, very uh, copious documentation of the torture. I mentioned the confession of Hunim. Uh, we have the reports of the torturer saying they whipped him many times, uh, stuffed him with water, that means water torture that's been used at Guantanamo and so on. It's very clear that these prisoners secretly and silently were forced to confess and H Hunim did that, uh, but he seems to have got a word in for Hu Yun while he was writing his confession. But uh, another uh, uh, prisoner I, I can think of that fits the pattern that you, you're describing was uh, Chuk, an Eastern Zone uh, official, 
who wrote at the end of his confession, I'm not a human being, I'm an animal. Uh, these people were forced to write whatever their jailers told them to write. But of course, I think they may have known that whoever might read that would be skeptical that they were really believing that when they wrote it. But it's very difficult to penetrate the prose of people being uh, tortured to death. Uh, but there is definitely a parallel with Stalinism. On the accountability question, uh, it's uh, quite different, I think, from the uh, Soviet case because the Khmer Rouge regime only lasted four years and it was overthrown by a foreign army, the Vietnamese army, which came in and, and destroyed the Pol Pot regime after Vietnam itself was attacked and the Khmer Rouge refused in 1976 and 77 and again in 78 to negotiate on the border conflict uh, but continued to attack. So the Vietnamese invaded, overthrew it and that's why it only lasted four years. It would have been in power in much longer if that hadn't happened. Uh, but therefore the Cambodian people uh, overwhelmingly rejected the regime when it was overthrown. Uh, many of them were suspicious about Vietnamese intentions, how long they would stay, uh, but uh, many refugees that I interviewed in France who didn't want to stay, they still said, the Vietnamese liberated me. Uh, that is, is a different point from whether they accepted the Khmer Rouge uh, ideology, but I think it, it, it goes to that, uh, to that question. Uh, so there, was, there wasn't much success, I think, on the Khmer Rouge part in indoctrinating the Cambodians in, in, their, in their ideology. I, I think that the regime was in power for too short a time, and uh, most Cambodians welcomed its overthrow. And I, I think it's very difficult to know the results in terms of the uh, reception of the genocide convictions in Cambodia uh, amongst the population 40 years later after the crimes were committed. Uh, certainly the crimes against humanity uh, uh, convictions were recorded uh, a few years before that uh, and they focused on the uh, destruction of the Khmer majority rather than the ethnic minorities. Uh, there may be some uh, ill feeling that the word genocide was applied by the court to the minorities and not to the huge number of Cambodians who were murdered, the ethnic Khmer majority. Uh, I think the court myself could well have prosecuted uh, in terms of genocide uh, crimes against some or many of the uh, uh, the, the, many of the victims of the Khmer majority, like the Eastern Zone case that I mentioned, the court could really have taken that up as a case of genocide against a part of the national group, which is specified in the uh, Genocide Convention. Also, the Khmer Buddhist monkhood, a religious group, also specified in the Genocide Convention. Uh, I think the court could have taken that case up as well. Um, but it didn't. And I think that was disappointing to many of the Cambodians who found that the genocide that their ethnic group, the majority ethnic group suffered wasn't recognized. But on the other hand, major crimes against humanity were recognized and leaders, not quite the top leader Pol Pot, but the second top leader and the head of state were convicted uh, for their crimes against the Khmer majority as well as the minority. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to turn to the audience uh, for, uh, for any questions you may have had. I know this last comment might have also uh, raised the question. Um, and if you don't, I'm going to just ask one uh, follow-up to that. So, uh, was aiming for a genocide conviction uh, not the best way forward with that and I think that there are several several uh, representatives here of the of the tribunals and a former uh, tribunal for former Yugoslavia and I think that it was often found that going for the genocide uh, convention 
uh, conviction was such a high bar that you really, uh, really missed a lot of opportunity to otherwise uh, um, uh, get strong convictions. Uh, no, I don't think that because the genocide uh, cases that were put to the court were successful. The prosecutors succeeded in those two cases. I think they could have succeeded in others as well. They'd certainly succeeded in the crimes against humanity. I'm not quite certain in my mind now if the crimes against humanity uh, cases that were successful included extermination, which is a crime against humanity. I think they may have included that, but I uh, can't recall exactly. Uh, the, uh, I want, would like to point out, uh, in terms of accountability and future accountability, I think this is a very uh, welcome development that the UN-sponsored Truth Commission for East Timor in 2005 concluded that the Indonesian forces in the 24-year occupation had committed extermination as a crime against humanity in East Timor. And although there were no trials on an international level uh, there, that conclusion of a UN-sponsored Truth Commission is extremely helpful for drawing attention to the crime of extermination, which is the crime against humanity, more, uh, more easy to prove than genocide, uh, but very serious, the crime of extermination. And uh, I think there are many cases which may not reach the threshold of genocide, but may be extremely serious that, uh, that uh, the crime of extermination may well be a suitable charge uh, for many cases in the past and many in the future. Well, I think that's a perfect note uh, uh, to end this session on. It was a very rich talk. I know there's a lot for all of us to think about, and I realize the only thing standing between uh, us and uh, the reception is me, so I will, not, I will not tie you up any longer. I would like to give a warm applause for Professor Kiernan. And thank you all for, for attending. Uh, the reception is in the back. I'm not sure the doors are open, but uh, some of us already know the way. Uh, I see one person, glad we're heading that way. Maybe you could just lead the way by opening the doors. And uh, uh, I look forward to, uh, to talking to, uh, to lots of you and seeing uh, uh, the uh, conference participants also over the next two days. Thank you. Thank you Wonderful talk. Yeah. Wonderful talk.